stereo, but uh, even a monaural system will work. Okay, the box in blue is the video cipher 2E, and the way it's hooked up, uh, let's first uh, describe that the video cipher 2E comes in two forms. It comes in the 2000E, which is just the composite only. In other words, it only has one input, the composite video in. And then there's a 2000EB, which has both a composite input and a 70 megahertz input. Okay, so let's first talk about the 2000E, which is a composite video in only. The way that, that receiver works, or that system works, is that we would take our composite out of our satellite receiver, and we would connect it to the composite input on the 2E. We would then take the clamped video, run it in to the uh, 2000E, we take our audio, whether it's mono or stereo, and run it in the 2E. Then, the, the 2E has a modulated channel 3 output, so we could, just as if we had on our satellite receiver, a modulated channel 3. It also has baseband's output, so we have our video out, which go to a color monitor, and we have our uh, audio channels, right and left, that would go out to our stereo. Okay, so in this particular case, all that has to be hooked up is the composite to make the thing work, then we loop these other connections through. And the reason we do that is that anytime we're not on a scramble channel, uh, the uh, system bypasses the 2E and just loops it straight through. And we're on a scramble channel, in fact, we get the uh, composite video turned on and it works. The other system that we have is a 70 megahertz loop through. And essentially there, we take our, our 70 megahertz out, 70 megahertz in, and loop them back. We go both directions. What happens there is we actually now have a, a satellite receiver inside the VC2E, which takes care and does all our demodulation. Either way, the system works. The price is the same in both cases. It just depends on what your system needs. The most versatile system is a 70 megahertz loop through. Uh, but I have found the system I have works on composite on most satellite receivers I've been testing. Okay, let's get on real quick here with uh, the front panel and show you what uh, all the neat little features it has and then show you what it can do. Uh, this is the front panel of the... Uh, a video cipher. We have a light here that tells us we're on a scramble channel. We're on transponder 13 and HBO channel. We're in the satellite mode. The rest of these buttons are for the purposes of walking through the different features that are built into this uh, as well as setup. And some of the features that are built into this we can get text, teletext, we can get messages. Actually we can have messages sent to us uh, by other people if we like. So I might have a friend in another town I want to send a message to. I call up a number, I give them the message, they flash that on the screen and he can get that message by pushing the, me pushing the uh, message button. So let's take a look at the satellite uh, picture for a second and uh, I'll show you some of the on-screen graphics that this little guy can do. So first off, let's take a look at it. We'll go into the view mode and we see we have eight different uh, positions. Let's go into installation and we can see the unit number is the ID of the video cipher 2, a signal strength 45 over 44 which is good, a service ID of A-0 a and then a location which is not set. Uh, we could continue to go looking through all those but basically we have uh, uh, the, the ability to uh, pay per view, credit display, purchase history, data reports, all kinds of wonderful little things this box can do. We can go into next program, there's no next program listed, HBO is not sending it so it drops off. We can look at text. Right now, there are no text. Well, there is a little bit of a text, as I remember. Uh, let's get a text. Nope, no text this time. The texts are, are totally empty. And then we have a message, and it says no messages. So at this point, no one's sending any messages to me. But this particular box has lots of neat features that go beyond just being a decoder. Uh, and in, as more of these go out in the field and HBO and the different companies get used to them, we'll be able to make more and more use of it. There's also a remote control available for this phone, from what I've been told. I saw one in a demo down at Macon, but I, I had, did not get one for myself. Okay, that's the unit. It hooked up to my um, receiver quite easily. I had no problem with it. Uh, I did test an, a couple of others, and I did have one that failed out of the box. A couple little things I've noticed is that in some cases, I have noise on the audio due to a low-pass filter in the right satellite receiver not being good enough. It's not the problem of the MACOM unit, it's the problem of the uh, receiver. Also, I ran into a little bit of a problem with one of the units wouldn't work, and I was given a um, customer service number for MACOM, and in 10 tries over a two-day period, I got nothing but a busy signals. 
So uh, as far as I'm concerned, Macom does not, does not have a customer service facility, as far as I can tell. I had to ship the unit back without ever talking to anybody at Macom. It could have been something simple. Uh, I'll never know. There is an audio and level uh, adjustment on the back for balancing the audio levels and the video levels between the VC2E and the satellite receiver. Uh, and that's very important to run through. You've got to have that and um, make sure it's set up properly or your audio jumps every time you change channels. And the last little detail, and we'll get out of here, is that once you're in the scrambled mode watching this, the remote control on your satellite receiver, as far as audio is concerned, doesn't work. The audio system comes through the VC2. So you might find if you're used to being able to mute the audio and what have you, you can't do that anymore. So clearly, once you're in the VC2 mode, the VC2 commands and runs. So anyway, that's the Maycom Linkabit uh, video cipher decoder you've heard so much about. It does work, and uh, I'm enjoying mine for whatever it's worth. So uh, until next time, thanks a lot, and have a good evening. And back to you, Pat. Thank you, Mike, very much for that interesting product review. If you want to meet Mike, all you have to do is come to the Space STTI Las Vegas show that's going on soon, very soon. Its preparations are going on right now, and that's in the Las Vegas Convention Center. We are broadcasting a live space showtime to you this evening from the Las Vegas Convention Center. And now with more news from Washington, D.C., here are Joe Boyle and Fred Finn. Thank you, Pat. I think that over the past few weeks, again, we've gone over this issue of zoning, uh, especially in the wake of the FCC's ruling. Uh, the uh, entire ruling was released uh, within the past week, and I think uh, it's probably a very appropriate time right now for Fred to, again, go over the context of that ruling, what it currently means, and what the ramifications uh, and the impact of that ruling will be on future uh, zoning ordinances. Fred, this is an issue that you've dealt with over the past uh, three or four years, and I think there's nobody probably that has more expertise in it uh, than you do. Well, it's certainly an issue that has been of, of concern, second maybe only behind scrambling to uh, virtually every home satellite dish dealer, particularly those in the less rural areas. And Space, about two years ago, brought this matter to the FCC's attention uh, in a petition for rulemaking that was filed. Uh, asking the FCC, pointing out what was affectionately referred to as the dirty dozen of uh, 12 ordinances around the country that were uh, representative of the types of ordinances that we were seeing, and asking the commission, uh, who is charged by Congress with regulating the spectrum, to do something about it, uh, and to preempt, that is, to outlaw or to overrule unreasonable ordinances. And uh, Senator Goldwater uh, instituted S-35 last year and was very instrumental in, in uh, getting the FCC to focus attention on the issue. And they did just um, uh, reach their decision. And they basically came out with a rule that says that uh, local ordinances that discriminate, that discriminate against home satellite antennas are preempted uh, unless they serve a clearly defined health, safety, or aesthetic objective and, and they don't prevent uh, the reception of satellite signals or uh, impose unreasonable costs on that delivery. And I think those last two things are key because many of the ordinances that we've been seeing around the country, for example, the, 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 the one that we've seen in a number of areas in, in uh, Long Island and out in California and New Jersey, uh, which says uh, you can have a satellite dish anywhere you want on your property, but it can't be any bigger than 36 inches. That kind of ordinance effectively prevents reception of satellite programming and I think would be clearly uh, preempted under the well it, it sure they sure didn't benefit homeowners I think that a lot of the earlier zoning ordinances did benefit cable television companies and am I mistaken in, in believing that at least uh, part of the ruling made it clear that these zoning ordinances can't uh, just be uh, constructed to please the local cable television company, no, the, which, the, which has a relationship with the cities anyway I mean these local companies are paying franchise fees to the cable TV companies, and uh, those cable companies view the satellite dish as a competitive product and are threatened by it. I, I think that's true and, uh, in a number of cases, that, and the Commission made it very clear that an ordinance that's based on a desire to protect one technology from another technology isn't going to stand. They made that crystal clear in their decision. Uh, two of the ordinances that were before them when they were making the decision, one uh, was from the city of Chicago, which uh, treated uh, satellite a uh, satellite installation the same as a planned development. You had a series of uh, hearings that you had to go through and $250 at a crack permit fee just to put up a home satellite antenna. And one of the aldermen in the hearings on that um, 
bill actually said, look, um, I, I'm voting for this, but I don't think we ought to kid anybody. What we're doing is trying to protect the cable TV industry. Uh, and that, uh, that was one example. Another example was down in, the, in the, an area in Florida. Uh, the then ordinance, and I believe it was Plantation, Florida, said that uh, before you put, could put in a satellite antenna, you had to get the approval of the local cable TV company. <laughs> Um, it's that, nice to have friends at City Hall. <laughs> uh, and there were other examples around it in a number of areas in the community. But I think the commission really did slam the door on that, uh, on that kind of ordinance that's designed to protect one technology uh, yeah. from another. So there's no question then, Fred, that this, this ruling does limit the ability of the cities to regulate against satellite television. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's effective date, I believe, is March 16th. Uh, it's still in the reconsideration or appeal stage. Um, whether it gets appealed or not, I don't know, um, uh, or whether it gets filed in reconsideration. But I think it, uh, if somebody does appeal it, we'll be right there defending mm -hmm. it. Um, and I think it's a very positive decision in the right direction. Well, it's something that you're keeping a constant vigil on after all these years. Uh, you just can't let go of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it is, uh, and what we're going to do at the next stage uh, go around is to try to get the word out to a number of the cities because in many cases we find that uh, a community is trying to do the right thing, is trying to adopt an ordinance that reasonably balances between what uh, some folks uh, want to protect in the aesthetic area and yet recognizes the right of the individual to view satellite pro programming. And often uh, we find little education is very helpful and we're going to try to get the word out to the communities in the hopes that they will voluntarily modify those ordinances that run afoul of the FCC's how, how do we, what kind of advice uh, can we give uh, either a consumer or a dealer who is still having problems, whose local municipality may not be aware or whose local municipality just doesn't know what the ruling is all about? Number one, they ought to get a copy of the ruling uh, and, and they, can can get they, the, get the, they can get that through, uh, through Space uh, uh, or through Brown and Finn. Uh, and they ought to actually physically deliver that to the person that's in charge uh, in the, uh, of, of the zoning matters in their community. And who is that person usually in case they're not familiar with the it, local city politics and local city structure? Joe, it varies. Um, sometimes it, it's the town council, sometimes it's the head of the uh, architectural review committee. Um, uh, but it varies, and I think you can call up City Hall and okay. say who's in charge of zoning ordinance is probably the best way to go about doing it. But I would actually get a physical copy of it because when you say something's happened over the phone or they did something in Washington, a lot of times it, it loses something in translation and there's no substitute for actual document. Mm -hmm. Does this generally take uh, a period of time before it does filter through? When I, something comes, you know, when something goes through the whole bureaucratic stage at Washington, before it now trickles down through a lot of local municipalities, is there? I th I, it'll take some time. Um, we are going to try to work with some of the city representatives um, who, who have trade associations in Washington and in Chicago and have in the past worked with them uh, to try to get the word out to their members also. Mm -hmm. Fred, I think we're going to take a short break and we'll be returning right after this brief announcement. This convention center, the host of the rather the site of the Space STTI show that's going to start tomorrow. A lot of things buzzing around here, a lot of noises, people setting up their exhibits, a lot of excitement going on. Right now, I am going to turn the show over to Taylor Howard, the chairman of the board of directors of Space, for a statement on the state of our industry. Thank you very much, Pat. You've been. Uh, We've enjoyed your show very much over the last few months. And today's been a very exciting day in Las Vegas. I've been watching the setup here, and we've been in meetings most of the day working on the uh, future direction that we're going to take. I'd like to talk to you about a couple of things that are going on in the industry right now. And I've prepared a talk, which I'm going to give here at the convention tomorrow. Uh, I'll read parts of it to you and then ad lib a little bit to uh, let you know what's going on. Some time ago, I gave a talk about the mainstream. And there is a mainstream in the communications industry in this country. That mainstream is one in which all of the video distribution uh, businesses flow. And we've been a kind of a tributary to that so far. And the title of my talk is The Mainstream is Deep and Swift. And we've been finding out lately just how swift it can be. And we've really finally done it. 
I've said for a long time that we would at some time have enough dishes and systems installed that we were going to get a lot of attention. We've got between one and a half and two million systems in the hands of consumers and businesses right now, and we have attracted the every fish in that stream now knows we're there. Unfortunately, we're not full grown enough yet to look like anything but food to these other fish in the stream, and as we're trying to enter our little tributary flow into their stream, we're finding that uh, some of their sharks are snapping at us. Before discussing what it takes to survive in that stream, I'd like to talk a little about uh, what's going on in the business right now. February in the consumer electronics business is always the slowest month of any. We found that in our six years in the satellite business. This February of this year, though, is exceptionally slow. We've seen that with many, many dealers, many, many distributors, and certainly a lot of manufacturers. A lot of, a lot of things enter into that seasonality, and I'm no expert on consumer economics, but I do see in California, for instance, one Japanese car dealer offering financing at 5.9%, and that says to me there's something unusual in our economy besides just what's going on in our satellite industry. When you see 5.9% financing anywhere, uh, you know that something different is going on. I can't analyze all of that, but I do know that that has affected us as well as some of the other things I'm going to talk about. Let's look at what are already in the mainstream of video distribution in this country. To name the inhabitants of it, not necessarily in the order that, uh, of importance, but the order they got here, it's television, uh, broadcasting, cable, TV, and the VCR, which has come along as a new technology. Originally, there was no mainstream at all. It was just movies. It was the only way you saw any video. When television came along, it was widely thought that it would destroy the movie industry. When cable TV came along, broadcasting th fought it and thought that it would dis be destroyed. Now VCRs have come along, and if you remember initially, Hollywood sued the VCR industry. Now VCRs provide large revenue. We're somewhat in the same thing. The satellite TV has really muddied the waters of the whole thing, and we find now opposition to us, jealousy, uh, all of the things that have affected your business and mine. Satellite TV will not really enter that mainstream until the money flow back to the suppliers of the video is established, just as it has been with VCRs, cable television, and broadcast television. It's that money flow that we're really concerned about, and that money flow goes back to the producers of video. Our hardware industries, such as satellite or VCRs, are really vulnerable to this. And we're vulnerable because we don't own that video. If we did own the video, we'd be in a different place. Now, cable feels they own some of the video, and that is the crux of our current problem. Now, let's talk about the video. It has changed in our regard uh, for it because of a very interesting thing. Our technology has driven the requirements for the amount of video to a very large number of channels. We presently have many cable systems are running 50 channels or more, and we have in our system at times 150 channels of active video. So it's a different thing. It isn't just six channels anymore or a few broadcasters that we have to support. There are people in our industry who feel that the video should not be paid for or it should be paid for some other way. And I'd like to examine that attitude first because it maps right into the condition that we're in right now. As a group, what I call the freeloaders, those that would say the video coming out of the sky must be free, have done very nearly irreparable harm to our industry. And the way they've done it is they've focused the wrath of the cable industry and the broadcasters upon us. We now have people coming down on us that say, that there are people in our industry who are crooks and thieves and are lying to the consumers. From the prattle of some talk show hosts to those dealers who are telling consumers the video will always be free, they'll never be scrambling, uh, we've begun to suffer. And we've begun to get back that image of pirates that space and a lot of us have worked for a long time through the legislative and legal process to get around. I don't want the pirate image. Uh, and those dealers that are doing this and those that are promoting that are trying to get that back for us. I found the difficulties with the group is that they're generally misinformed. They simply don't know how business works. They don't understand how the video distribution system works. They don't understand they're artists who put their hearts and souls in this and deserve to get paid. They just think it should be free. 
one of the arguments they give that it should be free is that it uses the space segment, in other words, satellites. It uses the uh, technology that NASA has developed over the years, uh, and we as taxpayers have developed, and therefore you shouldn't be able to make any money uh, out of it. What they ignore is that most of these communication satellites are built with private funds, all of the communication satellites built totally with private funds, not government funds, and that many of the communication satellites we watch every day are launched not from American uh, shuttle launches or anything like that, but from foreign launches where those are entirely paid for launch contracts. There's another argument that, of course, that the shuttle uh, is funded by the U.S. taxpayer and we subsidize each communication satellite launch. But the counter to that argument is you really have to turn that around because without commercial launch contracts, there would simply be no shuttle at all. Shuttle's very existence requires a mix of commercial contracts, industrial contracts, uh, military launches, and so on. So it's a chicken and egg thing. There is a strong feeling and a, a, a right understanding that the orbital spaces that we use in the sky are limited. They're a public resource, just like the airwaves. And for that reason, we are able to say to the government, listen, this is a limited resource. Let's look at regulation. Let's look at fairness. Let's use it in the public interest. And that's right. The other common misconception that I find among the freeloaders is that they think that advertising should pay for all of it. Well, let me tell you what's happened. There are hundreds of channels. There are going to be many more of these channels. Now, if K-band DBS had worked, like was planned for many years, it could have been entirely advertiser supported because there would have been six or 12 channels, and it wouldn't have been an unreasonable thing to think there were enough advertisers to do that. What's happened, though, with 100 channels, cable systems now know they can't survive with 12 channels. They need 25, 50 to give people choice. That's what we have, is a lot of choice. But there aren't enough advertising dollars in the entire world to support 100 or 150 channels of television. These channels compete very strongly for advertising dollars. They really have to work to get those advertising dollars. And that means that businessmen in wanting to provide this video for many reasons have come up with new ways of getting paid. Now all you have to do on your satellite system is go through and you can see people getting paid in different ways. There are people who ask for money, send in your money, donation. There are advertiser supported services. There are services that will sell you a decoder uh, just for their particular service, not trying to uh, be a premium channel or anything, but they'll sell you a decoder for their service and a monthly subscription. A lot of different ways of getting paid, a lot of experimental work going on. The premium channels, of course, get paid. They would like to get paid per view, just like we used to do in the old movie days when you paid at the box office. These premium channels uh, are the first ones to scramble, of course, because their lifeblood is getting paid. That's what they're there for. They are a subscription service on satellite or on cable. They would like to be a subscription service on satellite. I would remind you how far we've come in that a year ago, the subscription TV people were saying, we will never deal with a consumer. They are now all eagerly after us. And that's the basis of the two million in the ground. Uh, they now recognize this as a market. We have to find out how to adjust that marketplace. The interesting one to me, though, and something I haven't understood and it's come to full force in recent months, is what cable calls the basic services. Uh, typical of these are ones we all really enjoy, this cable news network, um, some other channels that are partly advertising supported, but also are subscription supported. Now, they have come to the point of saying, look, we don't want that much advertising on our signal. We don't really want to compete that strongly for advertising. We want our advertising to be reasonable. So we'd we need to get a subscription fee too. And this is something our technology has really spawned. It's both cable and satellite. Uh, people want to be up there, they need to get paid. Cable has figured out how to get paid uh, from their consumers. They simply shut a consumer off if uh, the consumer isn't paying. In the satellite business where there are many of these channels that are both supported by ad and by monthly uh, contributions, we haven't figured out the way to do business. Cable has put immense pressure, of course, on all of these basic services to scramble their signal along with the premium services so there is a mechanism to get paid. The goal in all of this, of course, for a satellite viewer like yourself and myself, we need a lot of video. We want a lot of choice. So my personal 
uh, feeling about the end of it is that I'm willing to pay for some of it if it's reasonably priced. More to that later. So much for the freeloaders. The system simply won't work if it isn't paid for, and I don't know of any other way to do it. There's no legal way to suggest that it should be free, and anybody who's a businessman uh, understands that if we're going to have something, we're probably going to have to pay for it. We get down now to the question of, all right, some's going to be free, some's going to be paid for. The question is how much and who controls it. Cable thinks they have an answer for us. Um, they will put together a package of video that they buy from HBO, buy from Showtime, buy from Turner, buy from wherever, and they'll scramble that package and provide it to you like you were a cable uh, subscriber. It's not clear the way the franchises are written in the video industry how those of us outside of cable franchise areas get a picture. The cable franchise guys say, well, we've got a franchise here and you're in a rural area, we can't deal with you, but you call HBO and you call HBO and it's 1995. It makes one wonder uh, just how it will shake out. Let me tell you what's going on with that. It's now possible to buy a decoder from a small cable company in the southwest, or there's one in Idaho, and there's one in Arizona. There's several of them around. And you can buy a decoder from this operator, and you can subscribe to two services together, not for $19.95, but for $12.95 or $11.95. They're beginning to compete with each other. What's happening, of course, with these decoders is that they're moving all over the country, yet they appear to come from a small cable system in one state. They're not only moving all over the country. If you look at the movie channel's franchises, or the movie industry's franchises, there are no franchises to sell to any viewer in Canada, Mexico, the Bahamas, the Caribbean. The skies literally will go dark in those places if there aren't decoders there, and there's no legal way to get decoders there now. There are a lot of decoders there. They're moving out from these small cable operators who are simply putting them out there, charging a reasonable fee. Lord only knows what they tell HBO. Uh, it's Joe Jones in so-and-so Arkansas, I guess, but actually the decoder's living in Mexico. Now, what will probably happen, I call these people the cable industry's own piranha. We've got a few of our own, but the cable industry has them. They're going to go along doing that to provide this market, the very strong market, uh, offshore and uh, in Canada. The big boys are going to go along doing it legally. They're going to do it in their franchise areas, and then you define, well, maybe it isn't my franchise area, as one, one of the more prominent packagers has said, it's my service area, and that's where I'm willing to send a truck to do it, not just the franchise area. So we're beginning to see them, and they are compete, and they are competing uh, with these piranha cable operators who are putting decoders out wherever they please. Now, the big surprise all of them are going to have for us, and I'm sure that they're going to time the surprise in a way that tries to diffuse anything we have to say at the cable hearings, is that all the prices are going to be low. Well, that's good news. All the prices are going to be low. There's no reason that you as a satellite dish owner should have to pay more for those services than a cable subscriber should have to pay. All you should have to do is decide whether or not you want to pay those reasonable prices. And that's a perfectly reasonable decision to make. I mean, some people will buy them, some won't. I predict that the same thing that the cable company sees all the time, they'll see immense churn in this. People turn on the services, they turn off the services, and that will be a problem with decoders too. But the idea of the cable industry supplying to us at any price simply won't work. And I'd like to explain that a little bit. You see, if you want to buy something, what do you do? You go to the person that's selling it. You go right to the source. You go to the person who owns it if you want to buy it. Now many things are subject to dealers, uh, distribution chains or to brokering because the distribution chain has something to offer. They add service to it. They add value to it. Or they do a function that can't be done another way that the manufacturer isn't willing to do or the uh, owner of the video in this case is not willing to do. For instance, Hollywood does not want to be in the retail business. As a matter of fact, they'd probably be prevented from being in the retail business uh, by the courts. So they have distribution agencies. But why? What can a cable company add? They can't add anything. They're, secondly, uh, they're simply a second middleman. HBO is willing to sell directly. Uh, my prediction is that most of these services that do package will be able to sell or willing to sell directly when our market is large enough and when they aren't afraid of the cable industry anymore turning them off or uh, not paying them because they're dealing with the dish owners. The stakes are very high. The satellite industry 
is now the competition to the cable industry in rates. The cable industry has been deregulated. The cable industry dearly needs to raise its rates for survival, for growth, to get more video. They are able to do that now because the same bill that made us legal deregulated them. They can now do anything they want with their prices. They will particularly be able to do anything they want with their prices if they control our programming too because then they control the competition's prices. We are the competition. Now what we've done as an industry, we're large enough not only to have attracted cable uh, interest, but we have attracted the interest of at least three independent packagers. We're going to see many more of them. I've been approached by quite a number of people that are uh, asking, is our industry really real? Are there really two million of them out there? Should I get in this business? Independent packages are ones that would make a deal with directly with the video owners, not through a second layer of middlemen. They would make deals with Hollywood, uh, with independent producers. In some cases, they may produce their own films uh, and uh, services as much like HBO does. These are truly independent. Uh, they'll be able to negotiate with Turner, with all the basics for that matter, and provide to our industry alone. The reason that hasn't worked up till now, of course, is there is immense pressure on every one of these people, uh, Turner Broadcasting, uh, uh, the uh, super stations and so on, to provide their package only to cable. And we think, my personal opinion is, that they have been threatened by cable, saying if technology, broadcasting, cable, all of these things that came along before did part of the job that needs to be done. What needs to be done? You need to get direct video access to every home in the country. For that matter, if you share Arthur Clarke's uh, vision, every home in the world at the same time. And you need to have competition among that video. Lots of channels, many different things, so people can have choice. This is that ultimate technology. Cable can't do that job. Broadcasting can't do that job. Only satellite can. It's my feeling that this technology won't kill Hollywood any more than cable did. It certainly won't kill uh, cable. It's not going to kill the VCRs or in some areas where uh, we had one dealer told that uh, they didn't want that in the yard because they were afraid it would kill their dog. It's just as likely to kill the dogs as Hollywood. What it's going to do is cause an immense video explosion, an immense growth, just as each of these technologies has before. That immense growth will do very well for our industry as well. But what we will do, wind up doing, is living in a complementary manner and not a one where one industry has killed the other. Make no mistake about that. That's a peaceful statement saying we're going to coexist. But we are a real threat to cable right now, and they are a real threat to us. The serious battle is the one over who is going to control the programming. We're going to fight that as a trade association through legislation, litigation, and in the marketplace. I want you to join me in doing that. We have some battle to go. As you well know, we've been through a sinking spell in the last months with the scrambling coming on and very negative press. Many of the dealers in our industry uh, that I know are doing quite well right now. Uh, our company has people in the field all the time talking. I've been talking for the last two days here at Las Vegas uh, to people that are working in the field. There are many people doing well. If you're not doing well out there, somebody is getting your share. Now, the ones that are doing well, uh, I've looked, talked to a lot of them and so have my people, have universally hit scrambling head on, and they've done it from the beginning. They've hit it head on and they've been honest about it, saying, listen, we have this many channels that are scrambled, this many ch channels that will be unscrambled forever. Uh, it's a worthwhile purchase even if you never buy a decoder. At least that's my view. Uh, that's the view of many people that have systems that were told up front, hey listen, some of these are going to be scrambled, but look what you get that's unscrambled and don't worry about it. If you want to get these, you will be able to get them. The unhappiness has come from those that have been told, never, never, it's okay, you'll get all these channels for free. The market is different now. I think we've made all the sales that are going to be made with people walking in the store, hey, I'll take one of those, I like that, my neighbor's got one. It's a market now where you have to get out and sell, but you do have to address the problem of scrambling head on. Uh, you have to be able to supply those that want decoders with decoders. Uh, there are going to be many ways to do that. The same thing's going to happen to decoder prices and video prices that's happened to satellite system prices, happened to VCR prices, they're going to go down. 
I don't see an immediate need to get in sell a guy a decoder right now. Um, wait a little while. Things are going to change. Prices are going to go down on those too. The key to all of this, though, is the competition. You've just got to remember that cable was deregulated only when our industry emerged as competition to them. We must not allow them to kill our competition. We must resist that at every turn, and we must keep doing it. It's the only way it will really work in the end. If you don't resist that, and if you allow uh, consortiums to come together that control our video, uh, you're going to stick the American consumer with a very expensive monopoly. If you join me and join space in helping to do this battle and to get past this through a PR campaign that will be announced tomorrow and through a number of legal and legislative efforts, what you're going to see is the American economic system working at its very best. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much, Mr. Howard. Taylor Howard will be back later to help answer questions from you viewers. Now it's time for a commercial break from Hero Communications that is going to tell you its story not through words, but through video and music. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Space Showtime. I'm Pat Olson, live from the Las Vegas Convention Center, the site of the Space STTI show that begins tomorrow. Chuck Hewitt has now joined Taylor Howard to talk about Space's advertising and public relations efforts, and later they will be taking phone calls. Good evening. I'm glad to uh, join Taylor here for uh, uh, this evening's show. I think we've just gone through a whole day of meetings where we're uh, in the process of trying to designate some new programs. The board has approved some programs, and I think they're kind of exciting. Uh, you know, we as an association has been, uh, have been very deeply involved, as uh, everyone out there knows, in legislation and litigation. Uh, we haven't been deeply involved in the marketing, PR, advertising arena, but now we're going to enter that race also. We have been hurt uh, very badly over the last uh, four weeks by a tremendous barrage of misinformation that's gone out both uh, through the press and through negative advertisements. Uh, we have tried to counter that uh, in a public relations fashion, but have been basically unsuccessful in doing the kind of job that we feel is necessary to tell the real story to the consumer. So as part of the program, we, uh, the executive committee approved uh, uh, in mid-January to move forward with an advertising program to support dealers. And uh, today, uh, the board approved a public relations program, which will call out for all-out blitz to try to educate the consumer about the benefits of satellite earth stations. First, let me just show you a, a few things about the, um, about the advertising program. We've, we're providing this space dealer information kit. And this kit is, a, um, is going to be uh, sent, it was sent last Friday, and every dealer uh, in the organization, every manufacturer, and every distributor receive this, uh, this kit. Inside the kit, you'll find, uh, you're going to find several items, and a follow-up mailing will occur in, a, in approximately three to four weeks, which will provide more items. The first item in the kit is a poster. Now, this poster is a poster that's designated to give the, the consumer who goes into the shop a, con a concept of the vast amount of programming that's available. It lists the programs that you can receive that are uh, uh, subscription free, as well as those programs who have announced their intention to scramble. And in that process, we deal with the issue head on. We in essence say, what should you know about, what a person should know about satellite television? It lists those programs and explains that only a single decoder is required for receiving the present programs who have, who have announced intention to scramble and that the first programmer to announce a price that said $12 will purchase all the scrambled programming except for HBO and Showtime. We at the same time point out that if you don't want to subscribe to HBO or Showtime, you can use your VCR, or of course you can watch one of the other 200 movies that are available by satellite television. We've taken that same ad and we've made a little change to it, and what we've done in essence is we've said what the cable giants prefer that you didn't know about satellite TV. And in that particular ad, we don't have a poster for it, but as, as an ad, it provides another column so that you as a dealer can check off what the local cable uh, company offers, both in scrambled and unscrambled uh, programming service. And you can compare, the, so that a consumer compare the vast amount of, of programming service available, either scrambled or unscrambled, or at the same time, it can show uh, and compare that to what the cable company is now offering. At the same time, we have another ad in which we are uh, we're now providing, which uh, addresses the issue of the tremendous amount of movies available. And then another ad which talks about the millions of American, um, uh, Americans uh, that have the satellite dish is the only choice in receiving this mass amount of programming that's available. At the same time, a cassette is in the, uh, uh, in the uh, packet, which contains two advertisements, three advertisements, 60 second spots and in which the dealer can tag on his own last little eight seconds, and we think this is going to address the issue head on. This is just the first packet of many packets we hope to send out to the dealers. We're asking manufacturers and distributors to sponsor uh, some of these ads in national publications and to help co-op advertising with the local dealer. Now, the, that is the advertising program, and briefly, the public relations program. We are going all out for a 90-day to 120-day blitz. We interviewed three major national firms today, and the board has approved the firm of Fleshman and Hilliard. They are the third largest public relations firm in the United States. They're very consumer oriented. Uh, we're going to action with them uh, immediately. And that, the major program will be doing a market to my market uh, public relations uh, uh, flash. 
We will also be looking for a spokesman for the industry to really represent our interest. The three messages we're going to get across is A, the satellite earth station has access to all programming, whether it's scrambled or unscrambled, and that, uh, that presently that the, all the programs who are going to scramble will require the same decoder so you don't have to get 12 and 13 and 14 decoders. And thirdly, that the price is going to be such that it's going to make a very reasonable price and you're going to have the greatest selection at the highest quality and we've got the best product out there. So basically that's exciting news that the organization is going to commit a substantial amount of money behind and uh, we're ready now to take some calls uh, from you out there for either Taylor or myself to, uh, to address. Can we have the first caller? We're ready for the first caller. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm William Shack. William out here in Mobile, Alabama. I had a couple of uh, questions I wanted to ask you. Number one, there's some other services over the video cipher too you were talking about earlier, the business services, and I didn't get the information, the name of the company that provides those those interfaces for the business communications are available. The, the computer interface? Uh, I'm sorry, we can't really answer that question. That was presented by Guy Davis, and uh, maybe we'll be able to try to get uh, a method in which you can get over him directly, but uh, neither Taylor or I are involved in that. Taylor, do you have anything? To no, but Guy Davis is the... Guy Davis is the contact on that. I'm sorry he's not here today, to here now to answer okay. that question. I have one other question. Uh, you were talking about this dealer package and everything, and uh, what, what exactly are the odds at this particular point for the legislation to be passed. What, are, what does it look like on the 1869 and the 1270 and everything to be passed in our favor? You want to draw that okay. Well, it's hard to it's hard to call odds in a thing like that. Uh, this legislation is on. Well, let's go back. If you look at what we've done in the past with legislation, we've gotten legislation through or attached more rapidly than any communications legislation in the history of communications. We're on a similar track here with over 60 co-sponsors on both of the bills. So I can't, really, I can't really tell what the odds are. The most important single thing right now is these hearings that are coming up. And it's been announced that we're not just getting one day of hearings, we're getting at least two days of hearings because uh, Congressman Worth has recognized that this is really an issue right now. A lot of pressure on the houses of Congress to uh, work on these bills. Now, what? What does this mean to you? It means that you've got to keep the pressure on and help us keep the pressure on. It really should be grassroots. But the pressure is really on Congress now. President Reagan said he was, uh, I'd heard that he'd gotten more letters regarding scrambling than he had on tax reform. So it says you people out there are doing a good job. I might add something, uh, Taylor, uh, that the, uh, uh, the hearings are key to bring out to the Justice Department and the Congress the uh, tremendous amount of coercion that's going on uh, uh, to force some programs to scramble who would otherwise not scramble, and also that the single distribution through cable only is unworkable, especially in a deregulated uh, cable climate. Uh, we have, but there is another factor you should realize. We have a three-prong approach. Legislation and litigation is considered long-term. Now, long-term, we hope not to be, quote, real long-term. We're talking in terms of six months to 12 months. Then we have the short term. The short term is here and now what we have to do to get the consumer to understand we have the best product available in a scrambled or unscrambled market. So therefore, that is the marketing segment we're undertaking, and that's why the advertising and the PR and, the, and providing dealers with uh, concepts, and in, in this packet that I mentioned earlier, we have suggestions from dealers who are now selling successfully in this climate that they've made uh, available to us that we put into the brochure that will help other dealers learn how to sell in that climate. So the short term, short term meaning the next 30 to, to 90 to 120 days is public relations, advertising, it's marketing. The long term is uh, legislation and litigation. Legislation we hope we within, within months or within a year. Litigation will go, may go on for longer than that. Do we have the next call? Next call please. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi, this is Dave Tucker. I'm calling from Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, first, I'd like to compliment you folks on the uh, fine uplink and, and really a, a very entertaining program that you've put on so far. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, uh, some frank questions and I'd like some, uh, some frank answers. I think as a consumer, uh, what we're seeing, as I think Taylor mentioned earlier, is, is quite a number of people who are spokesmen for the satellite uh, FTV industry. 
some of these gentlemen, such as Keith Monica, have been openly hostile to space. Others, while not acknowledging space as, as a spokesmen, uh, are offering to be spokesmen themselves. And in some of the magazines we've seen uh, two or three you know, uh, satellite dish uh, uh, organizations offering to represent themselves. I'd like to ask Space to comment on some of the criticisms that you've taken. And in commenting on those, I'd like to ask Space why it feels that it would be the, uh, the, the best spokesman for the industry and uh, how it would answer some of these criticisms. Okay, well, I, I think that I, I answered some of that in my talk. And I, I realize there are these rather hostile people. And the ones that I've talked to and tried to work with uh, have explained quite a bit of what we're doing. I find the response is always one that is designed to stir up controversy. And I, the only thing I can see in stirring up controversy like that is it's lining their own pockets, very frankly. Uh, we don't have any uh, goals in space in lining our own pockets, of course. And I, I don't even see space running along for thousands of years as a, as a self-serving enterprise. It's just not necessary. We're here to do a job. Uh, we're not here to make any money at it. The hostility to me is rather interesting. Uh, Chuck and I have both had the experience in uh, recent months of talking to people that uh, call as a result of these shows. And invariably, when they finally understand what's going on, they turn around to come on Space's side. And I really think it's an information campaign and that we've fallen down somewhat in getting the information out. And once the information is there in people's hands, they seem very positive. They turn around, many of them join. Um, some people you can't turn around. They're just negative. They like controversy. Uh, that's what the news is made of, and you'll never do it. So we just continue to be positive. And I think for the future, space is the organization. It's the only organization uh, that is working and actively uh, sought out by Congress. Uh, you will find comments from congressmen uh, senators repeatedly saying, listen, the reason you guys got this legislation is because space was in there from the beginning saying, we want to enter the mainstream, as I was talking about earlier, and that we want to pay for programming that needs to be paid for, a very honest, open approach. These other approaches won't work. You just don't get things by being negative. So I think that's why we're really the organization to support and work with. I've looked, very frankly, I've looked at uh, what I would do. Uh, are there other organizations I should be supporting, or should I be encouraging them to come into space? And my, at every turn, I try and encourage them to come in. Um, you know, don't shoot at us. If you've got a problem with us, join us. It's a democratic organization, always has been, very open. Uh, the things that are said aren't open. It's literally not true. Most of the answers are published. So uh, I say join us, and if you don't like the organization, turn it around. You should have been at that meeting today. Uh, there were good dissenting opinions and a lot of people working with us, and it did come out as a series of democratic decisions. Uh, I think I'd just like to add uh, just one or two things to that. Uh, I think I regret, and I think the organization regrets, that, uh, that a lot of the energy and efforts and talents of some of the people who are distractors seem to be oriented always at attacking the industry and internally, always attacking someone within the industry, either us or some other, someone else that's in the industry. If those energies would be directed at the adversaries, our adversaries or the cable industry, if the same amount of energies and resources were directed at the cable industry, of really seeing why there's been discrimination, who's trying to monopolize the distribution, who's really hurting us, those energies would be positive in concert with ours. We can't do everything. I promise you we can't do everything. And we need all the help we can get. And I would like to see those energies and resources directed towards uh, the adversaries of the satellite earth station consumer and manufacturer, distributor, and dealer. That's number one. And number two, any of these organizations, consumer organizations especially, that feel that they can accomplish something with $20 a year from a consumer, we hope that they're, we, we are, we're not opposed to that at all. We just don't think that $20 a year from consumers, we know what it costs to serve a member. And $20 doesn't come close to serving them adequately for providing them the information they need to do what they have to do. To do. We can't do it uh, with dealers for $95 a year. I don't know how someone else can do it for $20 a year. So therefore, you know, we are very doubtful that those dollars are going to be spent uh, you know, perf uh, you know, in, a, in a good sense. If they are, great, and we'll support those kind of organizations. Hopefully that they'll take and understand the issues sufficiently, that they'll take a positive stance that Congress will accept. Uh, thank you. Can we have the next call, please? Hello? Hello. Hello. 
Hello. You are on the air. Hello, this is Doug Lewis in Naples, Florida. Yes, Doug. I was wondering if that uh, Maycom um, the scrambler decoder would work on the Canadian stations. I don't know of any that it will work on. The uh, Canadians that uh, I know about are uh, on Oak Orion or the Oak personal decoder. How, how are they going to, uh, after you've, you, you purchase your uh, the scrambler, how are they going to charge that monthly uh, service to you? And how will they uh, control that? How, how, how will they turn it on and know whether or not you've paid the uh, monthly payment? Well, basically, that's pretty simple. You buy a decoder, and it has, a, it has an identification number, like your Social Security number. And if the cash flow from you stops, they stop sending that number over the satellite channel that you're watching, and you therefore no longer get authorized to uh, watch. Does that hit the question? Yeah, but he's gone. Okay. Alan. Next call on, uh, I believe it's Alan. Yes. Uh, Tom's from way up here in Fredonia. I'd like to thank you guys for what you're doing. And to begin with, uh, we have a problem in this area of where we have cable companies that want nothing to do with our satellite systems. I'm a dealer out here. And when you talk to cable companies, they say they won't talk to us, they won't deal with us. They say, that's your problem. You figure out how to solve it. Now, myself, I think it's a great advantage that if the consumer call any cable company in the nation and have that competitiveness to actually subscribe to their programming from HBO and get that competitiveness so the price actually drops. I think it would be to a great advantage to the satellite consumer. And I was wondering what your opinion is of that. Uh, you have to uh, nail on the, uh, on the head. Our primary battle is to ensure that free enterprise distribution takes place in programming services. 